Thank you so much and good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. We are just so thankful that you've been able to join us this day. And let me just say, I'm excited about today. I've been looking forward to this for some time because uh, what uh, uh, Reverend Dr. Neil Hudson is going to be sharing is something that, that we are very passionate about. Discipling Marketplace Leaders is a member of uh, the Goal Alliance for Church Multiplication. And as they seek to plant um, a healthy church for every 1,000 people, we, we help to contribute towards the health of those churches. And we believe that um, every Christian needs to remember and recognize that we do work as an act of worship, uh, that we've been created to work. And uh, we believe that uh, the purpose of Sunday is Monday. And we need to be taking uh, what we hear on Sunday, the equipping of the saints into those places of work so that we can be light and salt and we can be um, uh, ambassadors and part of the priesthood of believers. And so uh, I had the opportunity to, to learn about the London Institute for Contemporary Christianity um, about a year ago and uh, learned uh, about the books that, um, uh, that uh, Dr. Hudson has written, the Imagine Church book, as well as the book called Scattered and Gathered. I'll be putting links later up so that you can find those books. I encourage you to read them. Um, and it's just fun when you hear somebody speak the same language as, as you, the same passion that you have. Uh, and so we put a request out to, um, to, to uh, Neil to have some time with us and he was gracious and, uh, and was, was uh, agreed to do that. And so that's where we find ourselves today. Uh, just by way of introduction, uh, Reverend Dr. Neil Hudson is a senior leader of Salford Elam Church in England and a senior associate of the London Institute for Contemporary Christianity. He is passionate about equipping churches to become communities of people whose whole lives are transformed by the love of Jesus, who in turn transform the world through faith, acted out in everyday life. His books, Imagine Church, which is an IVP book, and Scattered and Gathered, also in University Press, set out that vision and offer some practical steps to make it happen. And that's what we wanna to do today. We wanna to look at practical steps. There's a lot of theology and a lot of theory. We need to figure out how to do it. And so we're so thankful that Neil uh, is joining us. Neil is married to Maggie and has adult children and two grandchildren. Um, and you know, having lived and worked in Africa, we can call him Uncle Neil, we can call him Daddy Neil, we can call him uh, Pastor Neil, um, Reverend Doctor, whatever uh, we want, but uh, uh, for a man with many titles, uh, we welcome you and uh, we thank you as a servant of God for being willing to share your time and your experience uh, with us. So welcome, over to well, you. Well, thank you, Renita, for that warm welcome and to all of you who are participating on this webinar, welcome to you too. It's quite humbling to see how wide this uh, this call is, you know, literally from across the world. And you are the experts in your own context. That's the first thing I want to say. I am very limited in my experience of predominantly the West, predominantly UK. I've done some work in uh, Northeast um, uh, America and Australia particularly, but other than that, there's kind of a sense in which when we come together, our primary relationship is as brothers and sisters in Christ. All those language of senior leaders, of uh, uncle and the rest, they just essentially mean I'm old. But essentially our primary relationship is one of brothers and sisters. And what I wanna do with the time that we have is just do, uh, I'm gonna use some slides to help us, but just reflecting on some of the things we learnt from the London Institute of Contemporary Christianity. LICC was formed um, many years ago now, uh, 50 years ago, by a man called John Stott, who you may well have heard of, who was concerned that the gospel would make sense, not only on a Sunday, but also on a Monday. And I don't need to persuade you of that, and I'm not even going to try, because I know I'm pushing against a wide open door. But within working with that LICC group, one of the things that we were doing was trying to help churches to make sense of that for their own uh, folks who they worshipped with. My context is I'm a church leader now and um, the local church is my primary passion. I think it's where the gospel is lived out. I think it's where the mission of God goes through, but not just in our gathered nature, but in our scattered nature. Let me share my screen. 
This is what we're trying to do, equipping the whole community through whole life discipleship. Practices that equip a scattered church. What we have tried to do in the same way as I'm sure you're also trying to do, what we try to do is empower Christians to make a difference in God's world. That's our primary mission. It's my primary mission as a local church pastor. It was the work we've done around the world with denominations and networks of churches. But in order to empower Christians to make a difference, then what we have to do is empower church leaders to help them do it. And in some ways that seems so obvious that it's kind of like, well, why even have the conversation? But I'm sure you understand only too well why that conversation is so important. Because often the work of the gathered church can become primary and the scattered church, well, we may not take that much notice of it. One of the ways we get people's attention, we found it's helpful to get people's attention is through these two diagrams. So this is the first diagram. Now, this diagram relates specifically and uniquely to the UK. Depending on the country you're in and ministering in, it would be different. There are a hundred dots and there are six red dots. The six red dots represent the percentage of the whole population who would go to church once a month or more. Okay, so it's six percent of 100 percent of people in the UK go to church once a month or more. It's not evenly spread. Some parts of our country, there is greater numbers and other parts is less. But essentially, it's around that number. So this collection of red dots are the gathered church. It's kind of like that's what it looks like on a Sunday morning, really, in the UK, when we all gather together to worship in all our different buildings. And you can see and one of the ways we talk about this with people is how does that make you feel? And people will say it makes us feel overwhelmed. It makes us feel like we're marginalized. It makes us feel like we're on the back foot. And there's some things that we do really well when we're gathered together as those red dots. We do remarkable amount of work in the UK as the gathered church. But that's not where the church is on the whole right now at three o'clock on a Thursday afternoon. In the UK, this is where the church is, scattered around in offices, in schools, in, ho in um, hospitals, at home, in uh, civic centres, wherever. And we ask people, well, when you see that diagram, how does that make you feel? And people say one of two things. For some people, it's like, wow, well, compared to this diagram, that diagram made us feel quite marginalized. But this diagram, we're engaged. Look how many more people we're potentially reaching for the gospel. This diagram, one, two, three, four, were on our front line, as it were. But here, well, do the maths around each red dot another five or six people. We are in touch with so many people, we could make such a big difference. And some people get excited by that. Other people go, actually, it makes you look quite lonely, doesn't it? It means that you're kind of in a place where you're potentially on your own. And of course, that's true. For some people this afternoon, they are the only Christian in their business. They are the only Christian in their school, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So if these red dots represent where my local church is this afternoon, then two things need to happen. One, they need to be confident to stand out as red dots. They need to make sure that they don't gray out. They don't become the same as everybody else. They need to have the confidence of the gospel that they know what God's asking them to do in that context. And secondly, they need to know that that context is one that God wants them in. In other words, I meet lots of Christians who go, do you know what? I wish 
I was in a different context. I wish my family was different. I wish my workplace was different. I wish I had different opportunities. And I can understand that. But there's a sense in which we have to say to one another, but this is where you are. This is where the Lord has placed you. Can you minister there? Now, I, I don't know if I'm sure you agree with me. I don't know whether you feel the diagrams help. But what we found is that these diagrams really help both leaders and individual worshippers get a sense of what we're trying to do here. And I think it's probably worth me saying at this point that what we found in the uk was that if we are just talking about the marketplace in lots of churches church leaders will say to us well the problem is i can't talk about the workplace or the marketplace because so many of my people are either retired or they're unable to work or they don't have a job so it makes it feel not relevant to everybody so what we did was we said, well, actually, this is good news for everybody, regardless of whether you're in paid employment or not. There's never a moment in your life when you're not scattered as the people of God. You may be in a paid employment context or you might be retired. It doesn't matter. You still have a place, a place where God wants to use you. And it's been our experience that changing the language away from just marketplace to saying it's the whole of life for the whole of God's people for the whole of their lives has meant that people in their 70s have been able to grasp that God has a missional in intent for them not just those who are in the workplace that has been our experience the second thing we did was we wanted to do, have a definition of what it meant to be a disciple. And this is the definition we came up with. A disciple is someone or a group of people who are learning to live the way of Jesus in their context at this moment. A disciple is someone learning to live the way of Jesus in their context at this moment. And we did that, and I, I won't take much time to explain it, I'm sure you've got it, but that sense that discipleship is not for really serious Christians and the rest are just ordinary Christians. Secondly, it's about an ongoing learning, because it's about your context. What is your context at this moment? Where are you? What is God asking you at this period of your life? And so what we've done with those two diagrams that I've just shown you and this definition is we've tried to prepare a sense of do we all know what we're trying to do here? And those diagrams become anchor diagrams for us. They're diagrams we keep going back to. And we remind one another that this is your life. You're scattered as the kingdom people, the red dots in a sea of grey. And in that context, you're learning to live the way of Jesus in your context at this moment. And so in order to do that, what we did and what we've spent much, many of our years doing now is trying to work with leaders of churches so that they might understand, well, how do I give people this missional understanding? And I know that on the call, there will be some of you who are in what might look like more traditional churches and you're trying to give them a missional imagination. And that's really hard work, to be honest, but you're trying to get them to understand what might God want for us. And I want to suggest that those diagrams, this definition certainly unlocks the imagination of people if you can take your time to explain to them what it might mean for them. And by the way, in brackets, um, I don't underestimate how long that takes. Um, you know, I was working with a group of churches and um, it literally there was one moment where we'd been meeting, I think, every two months um, and we met for 18 months and it was in the 18th month. So we'd had nine days or half days together. And one of the ladies said, I finally understand now what God is asking of me in my place she was in her late 60s so she was an older lady 
but she had spent all of her life in church. And what was needing to happen was a long period for her to grasp what that would mean. And if you're in a church like that, all I want to say is keep going. Don't give up because it can be difficult. But I know others of you are discipling people out in the marketplace and you're trying to develop organic cells of people who are agents of the kingdom. But our experience of that has been that sometimes people gather together as Christians and their primary reason for gathering is to support one another pastorally, not equip one another missionally. And so we're constantly trying to help people see that bigger picture. So as leaders, what we've tried to do is this. We've told leaders that what they're doing is they are shaping a culture within a church or within a group of disciples. You're shaping a culture. You're establishing how life is together um, in your group. And to do that, there's lots of ways, and the books that I've written suggest some of those practical ways, but there are three things that I want to explore very briefly briefly with you. I'm probably going to take about another 10 minutes, and then we'll have a chance for questions and, and reflection. But there's something about actually a ministerial posture, the posture of the pastor. I'll come to that in a moment. How do you develop a, a culture of equipping ministry, and how do you help people discover their purpose? Well, let me just take each of those one by one. How do you develop a pastoral posture? In the UK, churches who take seriously the marketplace, sometimes the pastors will go, okay, I'm going to do a, a series of three sermons this year about the workplace. And that's great. If they've never had that before, that's great. But the problem with that is it, it's kind of like a gesture. Whereas actually what we need is a pastoral posture, that sense of as a minister that I'm always leaning into how we are equipping people for the whole of life, not just gathering them for our activities. And there's three things that's involved. Firstly, the recognition that we are a community of vocation holders. We're a community of vocation. So in other words, in my congregation. I lead a congregation of people who I am encouraging to have a sense of vocation. I want everybody who I worship with to come together going, I know where I am. I know what God is asking of me. I know what's expected of me. That means I'm careful about the language of vision. So often church leaders talk about the vision of their church, and often that means what will we do when we're together? And there's clearly a space for that. But the problem is that if it's all that we talk about, what happens is our vision is too small. The vision needs to be of the town and the city, the region, because in front of us are the community of vocation holders wherever they may be scattered. Secondly, as a minister, I try and help ministers recognize they don't need to be experts. As ministers, we're expert in a few things. We should be expert in a few things, but we have limited expertise of many things. But what we need and what we can be are really good questions. People have really good questions. We can ask good questions. People don't expect you to be an expert about high finance if you've never been involved in that world. They don't need you to be an expert about education if you've never been involved in that world. What they need you to be is someone who can ask good questions and who can pray and who can support. And the third thing we found was that workplace, marketplace, is not a topic, it's a context. Ministers often think it's a topic, so they'll deal with it. Like I said, they'll preach a series of three sermons on it as though it's a topic. But everybody who's in front of us that who are engaged in the marketplace, this is their daily context. This is their primary place, not only for mission, but it's also the primary place they're being shaped. And as a minister who's preaching regularly, I'm reminding myself that's 
their context. I therefore need to understand some of that context. And I need to ask questions about it. I don't know about that world, but I want to know about it. So before this call, I was with a, a guy, a younger guy who works in media, um, in concerts around the country. He's a, a technician and he deals with concerts, um, secular rock concerts around the, 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 the country. And he's part of my church and he dropped in to pick up some keys and I invited him in and we had coffee together and I'm just asking him about his world. I'm asking him how it shapes him. I'm asking him how he is shaping it. I'm asking it, him about the extent to which he's seeing God at work there. I'm asking him about his co-workers. I'm asking him about how his plans are developing for the future within that world. I'm trying to help him discern God at work there because that's his context. It's not a topic. It's a posture, really significant for ministers. The second thing is we've tried to help churches develop a culture of equipping ministry as a whole. And I'm gonna give you four examples, and these are not new examples. I'm sure many of you would already do these automatically, but they give you a sense of what we, mean. So in, when we're gathered together, what are the topics of prayer that we pray for? Now, in our country, this Sunday, it's Mother's Day. Um, I don't know if this translates across the world, but this is a day where we celebrate mothers. We give thanks uh, to them. We'll buy them a present, perhaps, or a card. We might take them out for a special meal. It's just a day when we, we give thanks for those who've mothered us. And in church, often we'll pray uh, for mothers. But how are you going to pray for them? Well, we can give thanks in, to God for them. Yes, of course. We can pray that they'll have wisdom. Yes, we can. We can pray that they might be healed. The family relationships are not always easy. Yes, we can. But we can also pray because many of those mothers wear multiple hats so we can pray for them as they juggle family and work we can juggle for them or we can pray for them as they juggle uh, family and finance we can pray for them as they juggle their own feeling as a mother with the needs of their children with the demands of their workplace and suddenly this gathered prayer topic becomes whole we see the context it's just one example. There's loads. The second thing we've done is we've, for many of our churches, we've encouraged them to engage in testimony or intercessions, depending on your church tradition. But that period, uh, that moment in your service time where someone can say, where will I be this time tomorrow? So on a Sunday morning at you know, 11 o'clock, someone would stand and say, well, this is where I'll be at 11 o'clock on a Monday morning. I'll be in an office. There will be these people around me. I will be doing this. These will be my challenges. This is what I want you to pray for me because these are my opportunities. And suddenly what happens to a whole congregation is they hear that sense of we're a church on mission. We're a church who are sent. We're a church who are engaged. Third thing, of course, is preaching. How do you connect your preaching to this scattered lives of your congregation? So on Sunday past, um, I was preaching about from uh, Genesis 16 about Abraham and Sarah or Sarai, as she was then, and Hagar. That very tricky uh, relationship between Abraham and Sarai, who longing for a child and can't have a child. And Sarai says to Abraham, take my servant, sleep with her. Maybe I can build a family through her. And then everything goes wrong. And I was preaching it for all sorts of reasons, which aren't really of any significance right now to you. But one of the ways I landed that sermon for folks in my church, I talked about those who were in really difficult workplaces 
who didn't have much power, who were used by the people, who were then often thrown on the th uh, scrap heap by other people, who were left feeling unseen, unvalued, unwanted. And I talked about how God met Hagar, an Egyptian single woman who was a slave, who'd been essentially abused by her employ employers. Now, it's one of the things I said. It's not the only thing I said, but it's one of the things. But in my mind, when I'm preaching, I'm trying to help a congregation see that these texts are not spiritualized away. They're not individualized. They're not personalized solely. They're not interior solely, but they are actually lived out in culture, in real place, real time, and in context that they might also connect with. I'm trying to do that with all of my preaching. And then thirdly, and then lastly, I'm trying to help people build wisdom. So it's wisdom focused. How do we live well in this world? And I'm sure you're doing that all the time. And I'm doing that in small groups. I'm doing that in home groups. I'm doing that through preaching. I'm doing that through visitation. I'm doing that through prayer meetings. How do we make sense of this together? So my first point was, it's about a ministerial posture. My second point is about the ministry, the actual ministry we're engaged with. What do we do when we're together that helps people get this sense of their life as a scattered uh, mission? And my final point is this. I'm trying to help people discover their purpose in God. I feel very fortunate that years ago, I sensed that God was calling me to give my life to work for him in the same way as everybody is, but within the confines of the church. It gave me a location, it gave me a vocation, it gave me a purpose. And interestingly, my spiritual life has been linked to that purpose. Now, this may not be very noble and you might be a much better Christian than I am. But I have prayed on days that if I hadn't been leading a church, I might not have been so eager to pray. I've read scripture on at times where because I've got a responsibility for other people and helping them understand it, I've engaged in scripture reading where if I thought it was just about me, I wouldn't have done. Now, and that's right, by the way, I, we have to do that. But what I want for my congregation is that they feel the same sense of responsibility that will drive them to God because they know the purpose they have in their life. They know what God has asked of them. They know what, where God has placed them and they know what they're to do. So one of the things that we did was um, in one of the books that LICC produced, which is called Fruitfulness on the Frontline, which is a small group course, but it's also a book written by Mark Green, one of my colleagues there. We put together a, a kind of a, a prism of six, we call them six M's, um, six aspects of Christian life and ministry for the individual. In other words, we're not just saying it's about over evangelism all the time. It includes that. But actually, what does it mean to live this missional life? And what we found was that lots of Christians in the UK who sat in churches when we talked about this, what they thought we meant is that they had to go and somehow insert Jesus into every conversation, no matter how artificial that might have been. And what we, we didn't actually mean that. What we meant is we want you to have a holistic understanding of what it means to serve God in your place. And so we split it down into these three, these six things. So we asked them to think about, well, what does it mean to model godly character? And um, godly character, we defined as the fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, that long list in, of nine qualities in Galatians chapter five. What does it mean to model that? What does it mean to be kind, to be patient, to bear with people? Can you model that? 
Can you model it when you're the boss or when you're the cleaner? Can you model that? Can you make good work? Can you do work that's really good, that's done to the best of your ability, that is offered to God? That link that Renita talked about at the beginning of our session between work and prayer. And then the third thing we talked about was, do you understand what it means to minister grace and love in your context? Those three things, modeling godly character, making good work, ministering grace and love, they're really about consistency. It's kind of like, do people know that you walk the talk? And then the last three, what does it mean to mold culture, to change the way things are done in your business or in your classroom or in your workplace? Can you change them so they reflect some of the values of the kingdom? What does it mean to be a mouthpiece for truth and justice, to stand up for those who don't have a voice of their own? And finally, what does it mean to be a messenger of the gospel? And if the first three are about consistency, then the second three, culture, mouthpiece and messenger, are about courage and confidence. Now, they help me as a church leader to understand what I'm trying to help people get when I talk about purpose. But it also helps people on the ground because it gives them a vision of what this life might look like. And we found that is transformative for people in the UK. Now, as I said at the beginning, and I'm coming into land now before we sort of just look at some of the questions and perhaps uh, reflect together for a moment or two. This has about been essentially about the UK and the lessons we've learned here you need to, I hope there's enough to stimulate a conversation at least. I hope there's enough to provoke the, your own thoughts about, well, what might that look like in my context? What does it look like in my context to uh, shape the culture of churches? What does it look like for ministers or leaders in your culture to have this posture of equipping? What does it look like for the activities of your gathered churches to equip people for the whole of life? And can you give them a vision of what that might look like? Thank you so much for this. Um, uh, great information, seeing a lot of uh, comments of people appreciating what they're hearing and the, the insights that they're getting. And uh, some of the questions that we have, uh, that we are seeing are, are great. And they, uh, they're questions that I've heard a number of times. So I know it's representative of, uh, of a larger group of people. Uh, so let me, uh, we could probably go for hours if we were to fully address these. So, um, but we'll, we'll take a few minutes maybe for each one. Uh, but the first question is, is fairly simple. It's my church already has discipleship classes and courses. How is what you're talking about different? Well, I, I saw that question. And if I'm honest, I don't know because I don't know what your conversation is in your discipleship group. Mm -hmm. But let me tell you what we have found is two things. Firstly, that in discipleship groups, it is possible to be in a discipleship group and know nobody. So you know the individuals, but you know nobody in their workplace. So you don't know their names. You don't know what they do. You don't know anything about them. So in, in, in some places, discipleship becomes very personalized and about my personal relationship with God, mm -hmm. rather than equipping me and supporting me in my missional life. So the missional bit is tagged on the end. Whereas actually, I think what we're talking about here is equipping people as disciples, primarily as agents of the kingdom. So to the person who says, we're already doing this, all I want to do, if you're already doing it, I, I want to applaud you and apologize that you've, you know, you're on a call that you might not need to be on. But I know that that's not the case in every, in, in every church by any means. So right. I think that's the difference that I would want to make. Yeah. And I would just echo that too, that a lot of discipleship is between me and God. Uh, it's not necessarily how do I work to part of the fall was our, our relationship to work into creation. And that also needs to yep. be uh, reclaimed as, as part of the redemption process. So yep. uh, good. Another person asked, um, our pastoral staff oversees a large congregation and seldom has time for more things. How does this model deal with size and its challenges? And so if you could speak to, you worked with a number of churches and I'm sure yep. that you've heard that pushback a little bit. Uh, yep. What's the response to that? So I think that we've we found um, that this is a regular pushback. 
And, and I think that there's a number of things we need to say to one another. Firstly, this is our primary task. Okay. So your, the primary task of your youth leader, your worship leader, your pastoral workers, your preaching team is to equip the people of God to do the work of God in their place. That is the job. <laughs> the question is, how do you know where they are? Well, there's a number of things. Firstly, there's a, there's a mindset. If these are the missionary people of God and you are the missions leader, you would want to know where they are because you would want your ministry to engage with the context they're facing. You can't possibly, you know, one person can't know where 400, 500 people are. That's probably not possible. But once a week, you can, all of your staff, so I know a church where all of their staff on a Wednesday lunchtime have to make an appointment with someone who does not need to see them because they've got problems, but they're in a workplace context and they have to go and have lunch with them or meet them after work. All the staff, no excuses. And when on Thursday, then when the staff meet to pray together in the morning, they come back and tell their stories of what have you found? You can't do it with 500, but you can do it with one or two people per week, every week for one hour max. And you can simply listen. And if you can't do that, and I really want to be quite hard on this, if you can't do that, you're not in control of your own diaries. You're not prioritizing it. Your, your job is to equip the people of God for their context, not simply keep the machine running. I know it's not easy. I know you've got to keep reminding yourselves, but actually I think it's really important. And so that that links in, I think, to another question where somebody is saying, um, you know, all my time is taking caring for the flock. How can I get the congregation to change? But I think I hear you saying that when we start asking questions, when we start listening, um, the, the members will start seeing for themselves a change in 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 the equipping of the, the saints for the work of the ministry as it relates during the week. But would you can I tell you a story about um, Vera Vera Vera? is with the Lord now. She died uh, in November. Vera was 95 years old. Um, she was blind. She was bed bound. She had carers who came in to see her every day and they had to deal with everything. Um, so she was, she was uh, catheterized, so she wasn't able to go and use the toilet. She wasn't able to shower herself. I went to see her every week um, for a year because she, she was on the verge of death and it just took a long time. Vera had no power and no influence. And my job as her pastor was to care for her, except this. Vera knew the names of not only her carers, but her carer's family. And she would tell her carers that the pastor comes on a Friday lunchtime and we pray for you. How can we pray for you today? Now, there's a woman I'm caring for, but a woman who knows that she's a missional agent of the kingdom of God. And she's 95 years old, bed bound, no strength, no power, but she's doing the purpose of God. She knew her place. So I'm, I'm caring, but I'm caring in a certain way. I'm not just carrying. I'm not just sympathizing. I'm actually saying in this context, what does it mean to be the people of God? And I think people appreciate that. Well, I hope so anyway. Yes, thank you for sharing that. That's great. Um, you showed a book, uh, Fruitfulness on the Frontline, and somebody's asking, what does it mean? Uh, what does frontline mean? So maybe you can expand on that. Yeah, so we use the language, we, we use the language of frontline because we wanted a metaphor that said, if you're seven years old or you're 70 years old, you have a context where you meet people who don't share the same values or beliefs as you. It's your missional field, if you will. Now we went for frontline and like all metaphors, it has strengths and it has weaknesses, but it's accessible to all. And so people, so it became shorthand for us to say, well, actually, where is your frontline? Where's, what is your frontline? Where, where, what is God gonna, where's he placed you? What is he asking you to do? And um, so that's why we've used that as a metaphor for that crossing place where you cross, where your life crosses with the people that you're called to be.
be an agent yeah. of grace to another on the list. Good. Thank you for that. Um, I, I want, I'm going to have two more questions, um, and I'm sorry we can't get to everyone's questions. Um, I want one to be more short, and then I want one to be a little bit longer. So I'm going to give you the shorter one first. Um, uh, one question, isn't this close to focusing on the social gospel over the Great Commission? And, and I know that your dots really showed how this is actually a switching to focus on a more impactful way to, to be the, the Great Commission, to, to fulfill that. But maybe can you talk about some maybe pushback that you've heard about, um, you know, this is a change that leads us into areas that we're not comfortable with. Yeah, I mean, this is a this is an argument that has been around for quite a number of years now. The relationship between the Great Commission and and, and, and the so-called social gospel, and actually, in truth, I probably think it comes from an artificial divide as to what we mean by the gospel. So, one of the things that I believe about the gospel is the the intrinsic means of the gospel is i mean you know we could we could spend all day talking about this but essentially it's god so loved the world that he sent his only son that would die on a cross rise from the dead whoever would trust this act of salvation will be saved but actually the gospel is not just about rescuing us and taking us to heaven but it's about a people of god who bear witness to a god who will restore all things so it's from creation to revelation, this whole gospel, not just one small part of it. So I don't think when I'm equipping people to go out and be the best manager they can be, or the best teacher, or the best doctor that they can be, and offer that to God, this is not the social gospel. This is the outworking of the gospel. This is the gospel being played out into everyday life for every day. It's the blessing of God. And every now and again, every now and again, what happens is someone's doing their daily job and someone asks them, why are you so kind? Or why are you going the second mile? Why are you doing it in this way? And there are occasions where it's appropriate for people that go, well, because I believe in grace, I believe in mercy, I believe in love because I've been loved by the Father. And so it opens up a conversation. Now, I, I so this is the short question, this is the short question, <laughs> but it's a big question because it's not the social gospel, it's the outworking of the gospel mm -hmm. for the whole of the world. Mm -hmm. So that was a short, that was a short question. What's a yeah, long question? Short one. <laughs> I mean, we might be in trouble for the long one, but let me okay, I'll, ask I'll, I'll be quicker. No, that's great. I mean, one of the things that I, I think um, it kind of leads into our, our summary here anyways is uh, people are excited about hearing this, but it's also it's overwhelming to think about because you're suggesting a paradigm shift, right? That, that the church not focus anymore on the building and on the programs that are happening within the building, but we begin to focus on the multiple parishes that each church has when every person is part of the priesthood of believers. Uh, and so a lot of people are saying, how do I start? How, what do I do? I mean, we, we talked about this webinar being uh, some practical next steps, and, and maybe that was a, uh, a little too lofty because we're trying to get the picture to some degree. But what would you say to people that are, are frustrated or that they're excited and they want to see this happen? Uh, what are some, some first steps that you would recommend? So I, I would say this. This is, this is my sort of my advice. The first thing is do not say anything to your church. If you're a church leader, do not say anything. This is not a new vision. Don't go in. I've got a new plan. But tomorrow you will see people from your church. Or tomorrow you will be preparing a sermon for Sunday. Or tomorrow you'll be preparing worship for Sunday. So this week I'm preaching from Exodus 1 and 2 about midwives, about daughters of Pharaoh, people who are willing to be civil disobedient, women who begin a new salvation story in the workplace. I'm in control of that sermon in the sense that I don't need to tell the whole church, 
I'm going to start seeing in Scripture what's already there, and I'm going to encourage you to do the same in your life. So in other words, don't go and try and think, well, okay, so because this is what happens in, in Western churches, at least. We go, right, well, this is a whole new push, so there's no point starting now because it's Easter coming up, and then it was too close to summer, so we'll start in September. We'll not do anything until September. No, 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 no. The next person you visit, ask them, what's happening and how can I pray for you? And who are you praying for? And how can I pray for them with you? And suddenly you're asking them a different sort of question. Now you might already do that and that might sound patronizing. On Sunday, you're gonna be preaching. So what's the text you're preaching from and how does it apply? What would the person in the context hear? Someone said, I, I, I'm just quickly looking at, I did that, but they didn't answer. Ask them, don't text them. Don't email them. Meet them. The next person you meet, for whatever reason, just help me. Where, where do you spend your time? Not what is your job title, but what do you do? And, and how can I pray for you? And I'll pray for you all week. In other words, you start doing the ministry. Your ministry shapes the culture. You don't expect the culture to shape because the difficulty is if you just go in and you talk to the whole church, say that, right, this is how it's going to be from now on. They haven't got a vision of what you mean. And truth is, sometimes you don't either. So what you need to do is go and minister differently. Begin the ministry that you want to be true and see what God does. Because all you're doing is trying to unearth what God is doing. Because if we're right about this, the spirit is ahead of us. If we're right about this, I think what you'll find is people are doing far more than you imagine. I think if we're right about this, you will find that the people who are your house group leaders and your Sunday school workers and your worship leaders, they are praying for people at work and they're seeing God do remarkable things. It's just that you've never asked mm. and that they've never told you because it's just never come up. So it's kind of like we're trying to discover what God is doing rather than just trying to program a new way of being out of desperation. Because I believe this is what the Lord is doing through his people and has always been doing. Hmm. We're just trying to discover it. Well, that's great. Uh, that gets us, I think, uh, started with something. I just want to um, uh, answer the question some of you are asking about uh, what's next. And what I can see already is that there's a lot of opportunity and need to dialogue and to discuss this and and how do we do this and and what have others done and I find the best way to do that is through roundtable discussions where we can uh, really just have the question and answer time that we have a, a more time available to do that, so I want to invite you if you are interested uh, Thursday April 21 at the same time um, that we started today. Uh, we would like to invite you to a roundtable discussion if you are interested in that please email me. Uh, my email address is there, Renita at dmleaders.org. Uh, and we are trying to, to help to, to create this dialogue, this discussion about what does it mean to have whole life discipleship. Um, and so please uh, do uh, send that uh, email if you are interested in joining us at that time. Uh, for now, I, I want to uh, just uh, thank you, Neil, for your time. Thank you for um, for sharing your experience and your wisdom. And thank you for um, uh, letting us know over and over, it was, it's from your context. And we, we know that people are all over the, <coughs> from all different, <coughs> excuse me, denominations, all different countries. We know it's different and that's where we still need to learn together. And so uh, somebody did ask if you might make this PowerPoint available. And so maybe um, uh, you can respond whether we can send that out as a PDF. Um, sure, that's no problem. That's no okay, problem. Wonderful. And we just want to thank every person to take your time to the, for, for coming to this, for listening. Um, and we want to um, ask you, Neil, whether you would close us in prayer and to pray for people as the seed begins to take some root and, and uh, we start seeing the challenges of how do we do this and, um, and just pray for uh, us to gather as the church uh, to, to uh, embrace this. So if you would close us. I will do that happily. Thank you for being part of it. And thank you for all the comments and questions. I was just quickly scanning them. Can I just say to, you, to some of you, um, that you're here as people who are doing this out on the front line, out in the marketplace, and you feel really hurt because your church doesn't seem to have taken any interest in you. And I'm really sorry to hear that. Mm. 
it's not the way it should be. And I want to pray for you. Mm. Father God, for everyone who is seeking your will, who are trying to live it out well, who are serving you in their context, Lord, may your hand rest upon them today. I pray for the folks who don't have much influence in the church, but would love their church leaders to take more notice of what's going on. Lord, give them grace. And may their situations change. And for church leaders who feel overwhelmed, give us hope that actually we might discover more of you and more of what you're doing and that we might be overjoyed at the harvest. Lord, open our eyes that we might see more, we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. God bless you.